ask what kind of proofs would you consider or accept? Because some people will say they're looking for truth or they're open-minded or they're sincere in the pursuit of you know, knowledge. But when it comes to the Quran also impacts people in terms of their, uh, in terms of the moral laws that they follow. So it contains objective moral law, which is timeless and it creates boundaries. And ultimately, if somebody uh, is just looking for, uh, I guess the intellectual, the rational, they want something that they consider to be more on the empirical side, you'll find that history backs this up, that it is the only preserved scripture. Uh, you look at all the so-called Abrahamic religions, the Quran is the only preserved scripture recited today as it was recited then. And we only have- The ultimate answer to proving the Quran is from God. So let's watch. If you were to read this book from cover to cover, you would not find a single contradiction. Its eloquence of expression, detailed historical accounts, and challenges to produce a text like it are only some of the greatest features that make it stand out. But is there a way we can truly prove that this book is from God? That it directly comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and was not written by a man? A book revealed over 1400 years ago, is it actually a divine revelation? To answer these questions, we unpacked the miracle of the Quran and its proofs with Sheikh Sulaiman Hani, an Islamic scholar, author, and director of academic affairs at Al Maghrib Institute. We asked him to prove the miracle of the Quran, and this is what took place. If the Quran is divine, it must contain explicit proof to show this. Is there any evidence to back this up? So this is the question that is answered with an entire discipline and field called Ijaz al-Quran, the miraculous nature of the Quran. Alhamdulillah, I was uh, blessed to have been able to study this at the master's level uh, for a number of years and later on to do a lot of research. And the reason I'm sharing this with you is just to emphasize the, the following, which is I ended up having to write almost 200 pages of pure research on this topic. So if I were to answer this, I would have to summarize. And uh, to summarize, I will say, first, a person has to know what constitutes proof. If somebody were to ask, hey, uh, is there a proof that the Quran is divine? I will ask, what kind of proofs would you consider or accept? Because some people will say they're looking for truth or they're open-minded or they're sincere in the pursuit of you know, knowledge. But when it comes to the reality of life, we recognize in everyday life, if there's even a little bit of pride or arrogance or uh, bias against something, uh, then we're less likely, if even at all, uh, we're less likely to accept any proof of something we don't agree with from the get-go. Sometimes there's confirmation bias as well. We're looking for something um, to oppose. And the reason I start with this as a preface is because there are hundreds of examples that the Quran is divine. If someone is really looking and studying, I would recommend you read and study and hear about this topic, the miraculous nature of the Quran. It contains, for example, uh, the linguistic miracle, but it contains as well knowledge of the unseen, knowledge of the future that came true later on, knowledge of the past that could not have been known by anyone in Arabia. And in fact, some of these things were discovered centuries later. It contains uh, knowledge of who God is, his attributes. It, it brings about the perfect, most harmonious balance between what the human needs emotionally and psychologically, mentally and socially as well, as well as in terms of the uh, concept of the afterlife, the details that God has given us. Uh, the Quran lays out the purpose of life, why we're here and where we're headed, all the existential questions people ask. Uh, the Quran is something uh, the Prophet ﷺ could not have come up with. It's impossible, not because of the Prophet himself, but because no human being could possibly know the future. No human being could have knowledge of the natural world that is not discovered for over a thousand years. No human, no human being could come about with something like the Quran of 6,236 verses revealed on the spot, different audiences, different places with perfection and not a single error to the extent that that was the reason many people embraced Islam. They recognized this is the truth. The Quran also uh, has an effect on the human soul on the mind, on the heart. There have been many people who heard the Quran once and converted to Islam. Mm. There have been many doctors and researchers who study the uh, effect of the Quran on patients in clinics and hospital settings and how it would calm people in a manner that was more effective sometimes than alternative things or sometimes even uh, you know medications. Uh, the Quran also impacts people in terms of their, uh, in terms of the moral laws that they follow. So it contains objective moral law, which is timeless and it creates boundaries, but also it gives us uh, principles that can be applied in dynamic situations. So there are some things that change from time and culture to place. Mm -hmm. And so these are things that the Quran provides. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, if somebody uh, is just looking for, uh, I guess, the intellectual, the rational, they want something that they consider to be more on the empirical side, you will find that history backs this up, that it is the only preserved scripture. Uh, you look at all the so-called Abrahamic religions, the Quran is the only preserved scripture recited today as it was recited then. And we only have one Quran 
all two billion Muslims, regardless of sector movements or things, uh, historically movements have come and gone. Uh, we follow one Quran and it's the only Quran is the one that's recited in Arabic. We don't uh, consider the translation to be the Quran. And those are, this is just kind of like a summary of the miraculous nature of the Quran. It has been over 1400 years since the Quran was revealed. Since then and now, has any prophecy come true? Uh, yes, there are a number of prophecies that came true at the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There are some prophecies that came true after Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And there are some prophecies that will come true at the end of times, meaning they haven't yet manifested. Wow. Those are kind of, this is kind of the way to break it down. It's easier as an approach. Uh, as for the ones in the first category, you have the example of the Roman prophecy about the Roman Empire. It's very common. I go into a lot of detail about this. I have a lot of lectures and presentations and uh, just irrefutable proof from the historians of different backgrounds about the Persian Empire, the Roman Empire, and what was revealed in the Quran during the Meccan era that could not have been guessed, could not be lucky, is very specific and it happened exactly as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala foretold. The Battle of Badr is another example historically that took place and it was foretold that they would be fighting people who would be fleeing from the battlefield. Uh, in Surah Al -Qamar. Uh, those are two examples from the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu A third example is the preservation of the Quran that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala uh, foretold and promised that the Quran would be preserved and it was preserved. And this is something that finally, only in the last few uh, decades perhaps, we have a number of non-Muslim academics from different backgrounds, regardless of their own biases, have finally admitted, yes, uh, we can believe reasonably based on history that the Quran recited today is the same Quran the Muslims recited at the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is a very important point. Uh, another, of the, uh, another example of foreknowledge in the Quran is the splintering of the uh, Christians and uh, Christians splintered later on. And you have many examples like in the, uh, around the 1500s uh, with the divisions amongst uh, Christianity. And of course, from that you find a lot of denominations, a lot of continuous um, splits and, and uh, divisions and new movements and new ideologies that generally are all under the umbrella of Christianity, but at times they don't even consider each other uh, Christian and they will follow different texts. They will follow modified uh, versions of the New Testament. At times uh, they will follow things that contradict one another on uh, even on theological things. So this was foretold in the Quran. This is not something the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam could have known. And this is not something anyone would say uh, boldly. And I, I wanna emphasize a point here, which is if you have around 20 prophecies in the Quran and you have hundreds in the ahadith that are authentic that came true later on uh, no one can reasonably say listen you know that was just a lucky guess if you're claiming that the Quran which has to be perfect with no errors whatsoever has a single mistake it'll cause the entirety of the Quran to be doubted the entirety of the religion to to rely on something that claims to be perfect with no mistakes and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in fact one aspect of the Quran's miraculous nature is that it has no errors, no contradictions. So you cannot have a claimed prophecy that didn't come true. Mm -hmm. And a prophecy from our perspective has to be very clear, explicit. Not like these prophecies they talk about, you know, the, the French uh, man who knew everything ahead of time. I don't want to go into too much detail, but a lot of that stuff turned out to be fake. A lot of it was attributed to, uh, you know, people who didn't actually say it. And it's, it's not uh, explicit. The Quran is very clear. The Sunnah is very clear. So when you have these clear prophecies and they're consistently coming true, how many proofs do you need for you to finally accept no human being could possibly know this? This has to be divine revelation. You know, I, I spoke to someone in which I went through 10 different examples of uh, prophecies in the Quran. What I like to say foreknowledge, you know, it's, it's not like just uh, the Prophet I'm saying, it's actually knowledge of the future Allah is telling us about. And I gave him a couple examples. And then we got into this conversation in which basically it concluded with this. How much evidence do you need before you accept that something is divine? Now, some people will tell you philosophically, you just need one. One proof, one divine uh, statement of the future that came true should suffice for you to say no human being could have possibly known this. So clearly this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you don't have one. You have over 20 just in the Quran and hundreds in the Sunnah. How many more proofs do people need that the knowledge of the future that's found in the Quran and Sunnah is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The Qur'an states that no one will be able to produce anything like it. This can be seen as a subjective challenge. Who would be able to determine the success of this challenge? It's already established amongst uh, linguists and scholars of all religions that the most proficient of people in the Arabic language in terms of poetry were the Arabs of the 7th century. So that's already been established. Uh, the Arab poets of today don't come close to them in terms of this was their blood, their life. They used it for weddings, for ceremonies, for um, entertainment, for everything. Poetry was their life. And these were a people, we're not appealing to 
authority here, but these were people who, when they heard the Quran, recognized this is not like any poetry we've ever studied, heard, recited, or used. And so that's the first thing. The second thing is that it's not just about the language. Yes, we can, we can set criteria uh, and bring about panels of linguists from different backgrounds, uh, uh, scholars of the Arabic language. You can bring Christians and atheists and others. And you can perhaps look at different aspects of the literary aspect of the Qur'an, like Surah Al-Kawthar, the shortest surah in the Qur'an, and say there is no better substitute for any of these words. And look at the literary features and, you know, all of that. But I actually like to kind of avoid all of the uh, claims of subjectivity by saying this. If the one who is asking this question recognizes that there are other categories of i'jaz, the miraculous nature of the Qur'an, then automatically you don't need a panel. You don't need Muslim versus non-Muslim. You don't need any of that because uh, bring us something that will tell the future like the Qur'an did. Bring us something perfectly revealed on the spot with no modifications whatsoever using the uh, same letters of the Arabic language. And you cannot proofread, you cannot modify, just on the spot, revelation, recite it to us. Bring us something that will be revealed non-chronologically where you give us some verses and then randomly, abruptly, we're going to ask you for another set of verses and they better be perfect and they better flow perfectly. Bring us about something that contains knowledge of the natural sciences that nobody could possibly know today, but it will be known perhaps in 500 years or 1,000 years. Bring us something that will explain to us uh, matters of the past that no one could possibly know today, but they will be discovered later on uh, in terms of history. We could say you can't match any of these things. You, you're not able to come up with knowledge of the future and all that. Now, of course, the response will be, the response is, well, I don't believe those things are true about the Qur'an. I don't believe the Qur'an has, you know, X, Y, and Z, knowledge of the future, knowledge of the past, which shifts the conversation over to those topics. And then we have to say, okay, well, let's actually prove to you that the knowledge ha that the Qur'an has knowledge of the future. Let's prove to you the Qur'an has knowledge of the past, the natural world, and all of that. In addition, bring about something that claims to be from God. It is divine. It is wahi. And it has an impact on the souls and the hearts and civilizations as well. It has a moral law that is timeless, principles that can be applied to different people that provides real equity and justice. Allah Adam. How do we know the Qur'an didn't just copy ideas from established Greek sciences and philosophy? When people ask this question about the Qur'an and, and things of the past, you can easily see if you've studied um, Greek medicine, for example, and the claims of many atheists that the Qur'an has anything uh, that is borrowed or copied or anything like that. Let's say you take uh, Galen or you take um, the claim of water as a first principle from the Greek philosophers. It's so ridiculous, these, th this claim. Why? Because as, as soon as you start to look into what they claimed was borrowed, you find what? That's not what they said. That's not what these uh, people said. And if you have 10 things, let's say 10 things that a Greek uh, medic stated as a theory of how the body works, reproduction, anything else, and nine of these things are wrong, and one of these things that he guessed was similar, similar to what we know is true today or what was also mentioned in the Qur'an. Why would the Qur'an take one thing that's true and correct, add a lot of other true things to it of correct information that will be discovered a thousand years later, and then reject everything else that is wrong, the nine other things? How can anybody know that unless they knew what the truth was, unless they knew what was correct and incorrect? Same with the water as a first principle. There's a claim uh, that because we say as Muslims and we recite in the Quran, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حَيْءٍ Allah tells us we created from every living being, uh, we created them from water. So there's water within our cells, water uh, as part of uh, living organisms. Generally speaking, this is the case. But people look at that verse and say, well, I know that there's a Greek philosopher who used to say that water is the principle of life and everything comes from water. That's not what he said. Uh, in fact, what that philosopher uh, stated was um, they would they would refer to the you know the Greek to Greek mythology they refer to Greek deities so they would talk about how God is in things elements and so for him it was water is divine water has gods within it and we come from these gods and these gods control things and the earth was actually on um, on like on water earth itself was on a disk of water so he said a number of ridiculous things and he didn't say anything about what was mentioned in the Quran. But people want to frame it as, because of their arbitrary skepticism, as the Qur'an is similar in this one thing, so therefore let's doubt what the Qur'an is saying, or maybe the Qur'an borrowed it. And this, of course, completely ignores the fact that the Prophet and the people of Arabia didn't have access to some of these things, couldn't have known these things as well. And these things, in fact, were translated or brought into the region later on. But yeah, I mean, it's a very simple thing. The Qur'an is not similar to what 
Greek philosophers and medics stated and theories of uh, water as a first principle. It's not the same. If you actually look into it, it's not the same. For the Quran to be the word of God, it should be universally applicable through time and place. How does the Quran accomplish this? The Quran is applicable in a universal sense because there are uh, clear cut aspects of Islam that do not change, like the prohibition on alcohol, for example. So regardless of culture, time and place, it's something that's prohibited for Muslims. We're not talking about exceptions or medications here. And then you have things that are not explicit in the Quran, but they are principles, maxims. And that's an entire field that's studied. And there are specialists in this field from the first of, you know, the earliest of generations. Like Imam al-Shafi, rahimahullah, is very famous for this. So they extract principles from the Quran and the Sunnah. An example of this, what do I mean? A principle, لا ضرر ولا ضرر. So this means uh, do not harm others nor reciprocate harm. This is taken from the Quran and it's taken from the Sunnah. So one of the objectives, therefore, how do you apply this in a timeless sense? You want to eliminate as much evil, harm, or violence in the world as possible. And this is one of many examples that Islam is actually pro-peace and pro-harmony and pro-solutions and it's not pro-problems and violence and all of that. So the scholars take the principles of the Quran and Sunnah and they apply them to these new situations so that we can navigate them as a community, knowing that inshallah ta'ala, we're moving forward despite new experiences, we're moving forward with the same timeless principles. Can I share with you a quick story? Yes, yes, definitely sure. One time there's a young man, a college student, he told me he left Islam because of intellectual doubts. Uh, and he, he informed his family he became an atheist and he left Islam for almost three years and that he had questions that no one could answer. And subhanAllah, one day he decided after, I guess, these three years, he decided he wanted to talk to someone. So the, the family and this person, they reached out and he traveled. He actually traveled all the way to the state of Michigan where I live. And many people do this, but it's, it's a sign of sincerity when someone does that. Uh, and it's remarkable when they're coming from very far away. So he comes to the state of Michigan, we sit and we talk, and I'm waiting for him to tell me, what is this intellectual doubt that he had that caused him to leave Islam and never talk about it again, and he became an atheist and all of that. Obviously, every story is different. People have different experiences. He never had any trauma. Amazing parents, raised in a Muslim environment, uh, went to Islamic school, memorized actually uh, maybe most of the Quran in his life. So there was nothing personal, social that happened to him. I'm waiting for him to tell me, what is this logical doubt? And then as we're talking, finally, he opens up and he tells me that during his college years, he met a girl, they fell in love and she turned out to be atheist. And she started to tell him things like, well, I can't be with somebody who's foolish enough to follow a backwards book from 1400 years ago. I can't follow somebody who's following, I can't uh, be with someone who's following fairy tales. And it started to shake his faith. But what he said he realized later is, the main justification for him abandoning his faith step by step was shahawat, desires before shubuhat, pseudo intellectual doubts. And as we're having this conversation, I told him very bluntly, I said, well, do you believe the Quran is divine? He said, I've never formally studied the topic to know. He's like, I know about the Quran, but I don't know how I would prove it. And that's part of why I left Islam. I said, are you willing to talk about it? He said, yes. So he asked me the same question you asked me before. Uh, how do you know the Qur'an is divine? So I started breaking down 10 categories of the Qur'an's miraculous nature. As I went through all of these, he said, okay, I, I, something along the lines of this. The first five are very convincing. I'm still doubtful about the other five. I said, okay, do you need all 10 for you to become Muslim? Like, do you need 10 clear proofs the Qur'an is divine? Or is five sufficient? SubhanAllah, as we're talking about this, uh, he came to the realization. One proof, one category, of the Ijaz al-Quran should suffice. If you are sincere to know this Quran is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are now accountable. You, you have no excuse on the day of judgment whatsoever. And subhanAllah, he came back to Islam the very next day. He made uh, wudu, took a shower. His family told us he went to Fajr prayer for the first time in three years. But it started with this question about the Quran's divine nature. And one of the, and there are many lessons from the story, but one of the most important lessons is for us to be honest with ourselves. Sometimes people say, I have logical doubts and Islam is this and that and it's emotional or desire-based, like they don't want to you know, follow the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they see it as restrictive rather than liberating, uh, you know, rather than worshiping their desires. And the second thing is the lesson of ilm, beneficial knowledge. Consume good content as much as you can on things that will help you long-term, especially the foundations of Islam. Proofs of prophethood, miraculous nature of the Quran, two topics every Muslim should study, Allah All right, guys, so this was just in answering the question on why 
Quran is from God, giving us proof why Quran is true and is from God. You know, talking about the nature of the Quran, you know, and also spoke about the prophecy that were fulfilled after Prophet Muhammad left the hurt. Get it? So, I love the fact that he was able to pinpoint a lot of important things we need to know about the Quran and why you know the Quran is from God. That was a beautiful one, guys. Let me know your point of view. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.